Welcome to Sunday School for Memorial Day weekend, May 30th, 2021. My name is Brandon Keaton and I'm the Director of Music Ministries here at First Methodist of Albany. And today we're going to be looking at a great passage from the letter, the first letter of John, chapter 4. We are going to be dealing with this, this passage that deals so much with love and what the love of God is and how the love of God works in and through us. John is famous for his passages on love, of course, in the Gospel of John. There are so many uh, examples of this. I mean, probably the most famous is John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So we, we all, if we, if we have memorized one verse in all the Bible, we usually have memorized that. But of course, there are the other passages that talk about the command to love one another as, as, as Christ has loved us. And it even goes on to say that no uh, greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for, for a friend. And of course he goes on to say, and I call you all friends, I'm talking to his disciples. So uh, love, the love of God and love for each other is not a foreign concept to John. Well, we're going to be looking at this very uh, famous passage from 1 John chapter 4. We will actually look at verses 7 through the end of the chapter, verse 21. But this is all on the love of God. So let's go ahead and dive right in and see what, uh, what John has for us today. Beginning in verse 7, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Those three verses are, are some of the foundational verses that we all, as Christians, want to live by. Going back to that very first verse, verse 7, it says, Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. I think that this is a fascinating uh, verse because what it seems to indicate is that those who are born of God and know God exhibit his love. They actually reflect God the Father's nature of love. Just like um, you will see uh, genetic traits in, um, in those that are related to you, parents, children, grandparents, oh, uh, he has so-and-so's nose, or she has, she has her mother's eyes, or, or whatever. You know, we say these things indicating that we recognize that somebody looks like a parent or at least a relative. Well, the same is true uh, for, uh, for those of us who are in Christ. We ought to uh, demonstrate the characteristics of our Father in Heaven. Uh, whoever does not love God does not know God, or whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love is, you know, that's not his only attribute. Of course, um, John refers to him as spirit, as light, as faithful and just. Luke refers to him as good. Um, you know, love existed between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit before the creation of the world. And so God has called us into that love that already existed forever and has never not existed. You know, the, the writer of John, of uh, 1 John, returns to this theme. Uh, he's talked about it before in, in the little, this little short letter, but he re returns to this theme of Christian love and, and Christian love for one another. The call of 1 John 4, 7 is a reiteration of the command that Jesus gave um, at the start of the community. This is, he says, this is not, a, this is this is an old command, but yet it is a new command to love one another. And the question comes to us, well, why should we love one another? Because love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So we will 
if we've been born of God, we will exhibit familial characteristics that God has. If God is love, um, if knowing God uh, it, it means that we show that love, you know, of course, or, or better yet, that demonstrates that we have a relationship with God. Uh, part of that is loving one another. You know, he's going to go on to talk about this at length, but it's, it's, it's important to say it over and over again. If we can't love each other, that, that we can see every day, how can we love someone, God, who we can't see? Well, um, going on, uh, the pattern of, of these first few verses is, um, is a parallel to 1 John chapter 3. If you go back and look at, chap at chapter 3, verse 11, and then verses 16 and 17, we have a call to love one another, and then a definition of love, and then a demonstration of God's love, in the sacrifice of Jesus, and then we have a call to love in a manner in keeping with that definition and demonstration of the love of God in, in Jesus. The second section of this passage, you know, is more elaborate, and we're about to get to it, and actually consists of two parallel statements. Um, in the Old Testament, Hebrew, there are some passages that are called synthetic parallels or synthetic parallelism. And basically, this is where a, where a second statement roughly um, makes the same point as the first, but with a variation or an elaboration. You know, one that I think about is in Zechariah where it talks about um, uh, the, the king coming lowly and sitting on a donkey, comma, on, the, on a foal, the, you know, the spawn of a donkey. Uh, it's, it's trying to indicate more elaborately what, what kind of, what, what is this donkey? <laughs> well, you know, this donkey is a foal, you know, a cult of a donkey or, you know, a, a, a baby donkey, if, <laughs> if you will. So... Both of these statements are introduced with a this is. This is how God showed his love. This is love in verses 9 and 10. And how does God show his love? By sending his one and only son. What's important in verse 9 is that God's love was for us so that we might live and it was shown through God sacrificially sending his one and only son. And then verse 10 restates that point. God's love was for us and provided an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And it was, and that love was shown through God sending his son. So you get it. It is an elaboration, but he wants to remind us of it. Well, then in this second major section, 11 through 21, and we're going to just read 11 through 16 right now, but we continue uh, with what is, what is the example of love? And we start in 11 through 16 with God's love make, made complete in our love for one another. So let's, let's read through that, 11 through 16. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Think about that, that no one has ever seen God. I mean, that's an important theme in John's Gospel. You know, he says basically that no one has seen God except those to, that have been, who have seen Jesus. And those who have seen Jesus have seen, have seen the Lord. And God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Well, the love of God we experience as a result of his living in us completes its work in us when we show love for one another. If you ever wonder, well, how does God finish his work in us? Well, here you go. By, by us loving one another, we're demonstrating that we have the love of God in us. Verse 13 and 14, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, I want to stop there, too, again, just for a second. It says, he calls Jesus the Savior of the world. We may think of this as a very normal kind of a thing to talk about 
about Jesus, but really there are only uh, there are only a couple of times in the New Testament, and one is here in First John four. Uh, 14 and one is in John chapter 4 42 which is probably of, of all the passages in the Gospels my absolute favorite the story of the Samaritan woman and in that what happens is that after the Samaritan woman has testified to, about Jesus to her her village uh, come see a man who's told me everything I've ever done well then eventually they come out to see Jesus and they say in 442 we no longer believe just because of what you said now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world so we understand you know in that context that Jesus is the Savior not only of Jews but also of Samaritans well you know this is uh, an example of John showing us that that Jesus is the savior of all Gentiles as well as Jews and Samaritans. Moving on to verse 15, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God and lives in them and they in God, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. You know, it's hard for me to read some of these um, some of these verses because I, I have them so ingrained in my mind in other translations. I use the NIV for our uh, our studies. I know that Laurel uses the English Standard Version, both of which are are very good uh, translations. But um, I hear it oftentimes in my mind in King James English, and so it makes it difficult sometimes to read exactly what's what's on the printed page. But um, let's go back to verse 11 just for a second um, you know uh, verse 11 can be understood as the completion of the beginning section verse 7 through 11 but it also kind of serves as at the beginning of a new section and because it starts out with the address dear friends or as the King James would say beloved you know, those who are loved of God, or those who are loved by John the Apostle or John the Elder. So by saying beloved or dear friends, it's focusing on the necessity of the example of God's love being followed by believers. So while, while John 1 claims that the unseen God has been revealed in Jesus, 1 John 4.12, proposes that when believers love one another, God lives in us and is revealed in us. Such a loving community, of course, as we have already seen, makes God's love complete. Well, I think that that is a stunning view of what we are to each other and what we do for each other. That if we love God, we're going to love each other, then just like we're sharing, we've talked so often about sharing in his sufferings and sharing in his glory. Well, now we share in the love that he gave to us and then we share that love to each other. Jesus' whole act on the cross is him reconciling humanity to God. And so his act of reconciliation reconciles us, but then that act of reconciliation helps us to reconcile to each other. So that way our, our love is never just vertical between us and God, but it has to be horizontal. I have come to believe more and more that God has not intended us to live a Christian life in isolation. I'm not sure that we can. How, how do we become sanctified? How do we become fully perfected in His grace without having each other? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, 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 I don't think that that is a biblical concept that we can do anything without each other. And it may seem that John um, is lap, lapsing into a redundancy uh, through these passages because he says some of the same things over and over again. And it's true that uh, the remainder of chapter 4 uh, goes through very familiar territory. And if you have read the whole letter, and you know it's only five chapters, it's just a few pages in most Bibles, and so I encourage you to read all of it, but you know it reiterates a lot of the, the, the passages from chapter chapter 3, 
and and from chapter one and and all that but uh, he's wanting us to remember that these things are important he wants to remind the people who he's writing to that they have actually seen and heard the gospel that they know what that is like that uh, that they and that he was actually a faithful eyewitness to all the things that Jesus did and said. So um, it's it's important to remind remind us and to remind them that those that he was writing to of, of just how significant this really is. So you know it's interesting too. Back when we look at that, uh, when we were looking at that uh, verse about where Jesus says is called the Savior of the world, you know sometimes when we talk about the world, we always we have a very negative view of the world because we you know we think of of Christians versus the world, of believers against non-believers. But here, even though oftentimes in John's writings the world is is thought to be very negative. Here, this is a reminder that uh, God is in control over the whole world, that Jesus has everything together, and that he has saved everyone. Now, John devotes considerable attention to distinguishing between the children of God and the children of the devil. But God sent Jesus to be the means by which individuals become children of God in order to destroy the devil's work, as it says in 1 John 3, 8. Only disbelief and disobedience can find a person to the realm of the world. To all who believe in Jesus, God gives the right to become his children. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in that person and he or she lives in God. We can rely on the love of God who is greater than whatever might be a hindrance to our assurance of faith. These are both very important, very important things. And, you know, we get to the dual emphasis of this, of this short little letter. You know, verse 15 uh, roots the mutual indwelling of the, of the Father and the Son in us. In faith, verse 16 bases it on living in love. So again, love is made complete when that love, the love of God, bursts out of us. Well, let's look at verse 17. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. In the Greek, this, this statement, uh, in, the wor in this world we are like Jesus, is preceded by a word that is that would be translated because, and that indicates that it provides a reason why we can face judgment without fear. So then, uh, we might say that believers who love one another in the same way that Jesus loved his disciples uh, when he was in the world show that they love that they live in God and they don't need to fear judgment because they live in God. Think about that. You know, if you're worried about judgment, know that if you are living in God, you have nothing to worry about. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Perfect love drives out fears. It drives out our anxieties. Only the love of God can take those away from us, or at the very least, put them into into, into the control of, some, of, of someone who can actually do anything about it. You know, when I think about anxiety, and I have plenty of it, and when I think about bitterness, and I have less of that, but uh, when I think about those things, uh, you know, those are all about issues or events or problems in my life that I have absolutely no control over. And so I can either sit and fret and wring my hands and hope hope against all hope that everything works out, or I can trust the perfect love of God that casts out fears and anxieties. And now you might, you might say, well, that's easy for you to say, but you don't know what I'm dealing with. And you're right, I don't. But I do know the one who does. 
And thanks be to God, he has given us a way to avoid the mess and, and avoid getting down into the fray. We, 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 there are some of us who just seem to love the mess, you know, and, and every time we turn around, there is something else going on. But I want to tell you that God is at work and that no matter no matter how that is how that is happening whatever is going on in our lives he is going to help us if we let him um, we can look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, just like it says in Hebrews chapter 12, or we can look to ourselves, or we can look to our friend, or we can look to somebody else. But here is the thing, is that that somebody else is not necessarily going to be able to help you, and they surely are not going to be able to help you the way that uh, Jesus can. So, you know, it's often been observed that in the thought process of John's Gospel and of the letters of John that he focuses on the present reality of what we commonly would think of as future events like judgment and resurrection. He talks like these things are already happening right now. It doesn't really mean that John has eliminated any, any future expectation. He, he knows there will be a resurrection of the last day, and he knows that there will be a judgment day. But he also wants us to guard our behavior like we're living under that pressure in that way, so that we can have confidence when those days come, when the day of judgment comes, we can have this confidence in our earthly life. And see, I, I just want to say that eternal life, eternal living, begins now. It doesn't begin when we die. It begins here on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. That is all of it. That's all of the story. Is that he's that he's wanting to perfect us now. He's wanting to calm us now. He's wanting to assure us now. He's wanting to us to live in him now. Now, you know, again, perfect love. Um, you know, the reference to perfect love and to the fearful person who is not made perfect in love. You know, you have to be have to read it in the light of what made complete means in those verses before, like verse 12 and verse 17. The one who is made complete is the one who lives in love, and God's love is made complete in us if we love one another. So perfect love then um, appears to be love made complete, love that is acted out. We are like him in this life to the extent our lives are characterized by sacrificial love. Just as Jesus' life was. Oh, I want, I want that to be true. I want that to be true of me, and I want that to be true of all of us. What would the world be like if we all stopped worrying about ourselves and started worrying about each other? I have this I have this sense that our needs would be met and our issues would be dealt with and part of that would not would be of course that Jesus would be taking care of them because when we live in love we live in him but also because when we live in love our problems diminish just like John said, I mean, just like John the Baptist says in the Gospel of John, he must increase and I must decrease. It's not only that that his presence needs to increase, or that that the ability of Christ needs to increase, but also the vision of Christ needs to increase, and our vision. Our earthly one needs to decrease when we become like him. I, our vision expands to such a great a great amount that uh, I, I think it's sad and sometimes that we want to hold on to some of these earthly things when there is so much more that God really really wants for us. Well, let's finish out the chapter. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. 
So in this final section of, of the book, that's that's starting really basically right here and going into chapter five, um, it's devoted to the love of fellow believers. And, and so of course it re returns again to that same theme. You know, the focus is not on divine grace toward uh, sinners, you know, unbelieving people, um, as it is in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Rather, the point is, once again, the necessity of practical Christian love in keeping with both the nature and the example of God. What I think is great is that the love of God is practical. Again, it not only is what he what he desires for us, but because it is what is best for us. And not only what is best, but that it fulfills us in a way that other things cannot. You know, in verse 20, we have a parallel to 1 John uh, verses 1, 1, excuse me, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 and, and 2, 4. Um, and I want you to look at that in the study guide notes that, you know, and so because I think that will be, that will be helpful to you. But I want to say without doubt, one who shows no love for fellow believers who are right in front of them should not be believed when that person claims to love God. And let me tell you, not everybody's easy to love. I don't. I don't think I have to tell you that. There are a lot of people who are not. And the truth of the matter is, is that um, you know we all have our thresholds. I understand that we are human, but God is calling us to be something more than ourselves, and we can't do that without being in Him. Claims to love a God that we cannot see are easy to make. I love God. God is love. You know, we can say that till we're blue in the face, but the real test of being a child of God is to love believers in need, or believers who drive us crazy, or non-believers who, um, who we're trying to bring into the fold of God. This is the command of God. Love for God must be accompanied by love for fellow believers. And I charge you today to really consider this, to really think on it. How do we show love for each other? How do we show love for God? We show love for God by loving each other. Love is a very, very active thing. It is not passive. It is not sweet. It is a, it is a hard, hard thing. But it is the greatest gift that we have. It is the fulfillment of all the gifts of the Spirit to show love, to demonstrate love. And it is the one thing that we are commanded above all others to love God and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. These are the great commandments. And thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen.